so today we want to talk about the unfortunate traveler by Thomas Nash. The unfortunate traveler is a Renaissance Post, a Renaissance Post published in 1594, and it is a good example of a picaresque novel. It is a good example of a picaresque novel. So while we studied the, the anatomy of wit as uh, constituting the euphoristic style, we will study The Unfortunate Traveler as a picaresque novel. So maybe first of all we need to understand what the picaresque novel is all about, what it means. So the question now is, what is a picaresque novel? What is a picaresque novel? What is a picaresque novel? So the picaresque novel is an adventurous novel that revolves around a hero Known as a known as a picaro. The picaresque novel is an adventurous novel that revolves around a hero known as the picaro or a picaro. P i c a r o. The picaro is a Spanish word for. Rook. It's a Spanish word which means which means rook. R O G U E. Rook. Or a highwayman. So the hero of the picaresque novel is the picaro. The hero of the picaresque novel is the picaro. P I C A R O. It's a rogue or a highwayman, person of questionable character. Remember that the novel is an adventure novel, so the hero gets himself involved in different adventures that entertain the reader of the novel. In the novel, it is seen that the hero moves from place to place. In the novel, it is seen that the hero moves from place to place. As he encounters many dangerous events and he learns to survive by his intelligence or what is called wit, W-I-T. The hero moves from place to place and survives by his wit or intelligence. The picaresque novel has an episodic plot structure. The picaresque novel has an episodic plot structure. The picaresque novel has an episodic plot structure. Episodic, E-P-I-S-O-D-I-C. This means that the events are organized in episodes. The events are organized in episodes. There are different events whose connection is possible only through the existence of one central character, that is the Picaro. So it's the Picaro that unites the plot, the episodic plot of the work. So the Picaresque novel has a Spanish origin. The Picaresque novel has a Spanish origin.
but the unfortunate traveler is its English example. But the unfortunate traveler is an English example of the picaresque novel. The novel tells the story of Jack Wilton. The novel tells the story of Jack Wilton. Jack is spelled J-A-C-K. Wilton is spelled W-I-L-T-O-N. Jack Wilton. When a novel opens, when a novel opens, Jack Wilton is a soldier in the service of King Henry the Earth. The novel opens, Jack Wilton is a soldier in the service of King Henry the Earth. Wilton is spelled W-I-L-T-O-N. W-I-L-T-O-N. Wilton. The work is written from the first person narrative point of view. The work is written from the first person narrative point of view. And Jack is the narrator. And Jack Wilton is the narrator. The Unfortunate Traveler can be read as a self-narrative fiction. Can be read as a self-narrative fiction. The work can be read as a self-narrative fiction That means it is autobiographical, autobiographical, self narrative fiction. The work can also be read as a traveler. The work can also be read as a traveler. The work can also be read as what? A traveler. Traveler is spelled. T R A V E L O G U E Traveler. A work of art that is based on a journey. A work of art that describes a journey. A work of art that is based on a journey. It's a traveler. The Unfortunate Traveler is an extended commentary on the political religious issues of its time. An extended narrative, extended commentary on the political religious issues of its time. The work is an extended narrative a Senate commentary on the political religious issues of its time. The work is set in many places. The unfortunate traveler is set in many places. And these are the places that the, the narrator travels to. These are the places that the narrator travels to, wherever his journey takes him. For instance, the, the, the narrator travels through England or Great Britain, travels through France, travels through Germany, the Netherlands, and Italy. His journey takes him across the Great Britain, Takes him to France, 
Tax him to Germany, to the Netherlands, and to Italy. So when the story begins, as we already said, Jack Wilton is serving as a page in the army of King James the Eighth. A page, like a PA. Like a PA, PA page, P A G E. In the army of King Henry the Earth. Like a personal assistant. The army is camping close to a place called Terwin in France. A place called Terwin in France. T U R W I N. Terwin in France. Jack is a rascally fellow and he plays pranks on people. Jack is a rascally fellow who plays pranks on people. So he, he, he plays a prank on a merchant in the camp. He plays a prank on a merchant in the farm, in the camp. Now the person supplies the army its goods. It's called a sutler. S U T L E R sutler. He tells the man that he had overheard the king in council planning his execution for treason. And the man is going to be executed for treason. It's a prank. He tells the man that he has overheard the king in council planning his execution for treasonable offenses. And he says that to, to appease the king, the man should distribute his goods freely among the soldiers and then ask the king for mercy. First of all, for you to earn the for you to earn the for you to earn the mercy of the king, you have to you have to distribute your goods freely in the camp to all the soldiers, and then you ask the king for mercy. So this prank amuses the king. This prank amuses the king who forgives Jack and then compensates the, the settler. The king is amused by the prank, so he forgives Jack and compensates the settler for his losses after he had distributed gifts. It goes freely to the to the soldiers. Jack becomes friends with a captain who makes him throw dice for him in order to make the captain rich. Jack becomes friends with a captain who makes him throw dice for him in order to make the captain rich. Among other activities in the camp, among other activities in the camp. Okay, so in the story, Jack makes a fool.
of Captain Capino, Capitano. Jam makes a fool of Captain Capitano. C A P I T A N O. It makes the man think that he's a great soldier. The man is at the point he's so full himself that he decides to leave the camp for a secret mission. After asking Jack of money and secrecy. By merely he leaves the camp. Jack reports that the man has deserted the army and that he should be replaced. The man goes to the captain, the foolish captain, or the man who prides himself a, a great captain, goes to the enemy's side. The enemy is come. To carry out to him is wants to carry out an act of heroism on his one man mission uh, journey. The man is thoroughly searched before being brought to uh, the French king, the minion king, not the real king. Then the true king soon comes out and orders that the man be treated for a spy and be tortured till he confesses. So one of the important literary devices in this work, or narrative devices in this work, is humor. Note that one of the major narrative devices in the work is humor. So you could see that the man is a coward, the man is a coward because immediately, immediately he sees the torture instrument. Immediately he sees the torture instrument. He is afraid. So he screams the truth out that he was a poor captain in the English camp. And he was deceived by Jack Wilton to come and kill the French king in bravery and, and return. And I had no other intention in the world apart from this deception. So the French are seen laughing at the man's stupidity. They consider him a fool and hope to whip uh, home all the English fools shortly. So that, that's, a, that's another occasion of Jack's prank in the camp. At another occasion, Jack uh, disguises as a lady to be wooed by by a captain who gives him money in exchange for romance. But Jack finds excuses and leaves and never returns. Another plan is that Jack scares a set of clerks who run over at the mention of treason, leaving their money and writing decks behind. Jack's case a set of clerks who run off after uh, a dimension of treason. Treason was a serious offense, of course, in Henry the Eighth time. If you remember what happened to someone like the Chancellor Moore. So the battle at Tony and Tewin is soon won, and the king returns to England. Jack then returns to his boring life at court. But we already said that Jack is a page at court. So when the battle is over, everyone returns 
to England and Jack returns to his boring life at court. So at court, Jack has a pastime. He says, I must not discover that ungodly dealing we had with the black jacks. Or sure I was crowned king of the drunkards with the court cup. So that's the pastime the, the, that he had with others in the court. Showing that in the court, the assistants hardly have much to do than to play uh, pranks. Jack is depicting as growing older and soon he leaves England due to the sweating sickness. Jack soon leaves England due to the sweating uh, sickness. No, not that um, a great portion of this text is a response to history. For instance, someone that Harry the Earth actually ruled England. And some of the events depicted satirize his reign. So the sweating sickness was a sudden sickness that killed within hours. Sweating sickness, sweat. And was denoted by the victim sweating. So Jack leaves England because of the sweating sickness. It was like a plague. Jack decides to be a soldier of fortune. When he leaves England, Jack decides to be a soldier of fortune. A soldier of fortune is one who fights for money, not for patriotism. A soldier of fortune is one who fights for money, not out of patriotism. That means he can fight on any side, as long as they have offered him the money that he wants. So this is um, what it says. At Tarwin, I was a demi-soldier in jest. So now I became a martialist, a martialist in earnest. He hurries to join the strongest side in the battle between the French and the Swiss. He wants to fight on the side that is stronger so that he will emerge winner. So in the battle of the French and the Swiss, he fights on the side So in the battle, Jack describes the obscenities of war. Jack describes the obscenities of war. War as an obscene phenomenon is depicted in the work. He says, it was my good, it was my good luck or my ill I don't know which, to come just to the fighting of the battle where I saw a wonderful spectacle of blood on both sides. Here on Willie, sweet sass, wallowing in their gore like an ox in his dung. There the slightly French, sprawling and turning on the stained grass like a roach, taken out of the stream, showing how the soldiers are suffering after killing each other. So the French defeat the Swiss at this battle. The winners of this battle are the French. Uh, 
After this battle, Jack moves to Germany to a place called Munster, M-U-N-S-T-R. The place called Munster. In Germany, there is another battle ongoing between the Anabaptists and the, and the Emperor and the Duke of Saxony. It looks like a religious war. The Anabaptists are fighting against the Emperor and the Duke of Saxony. The Anabaptists are in the city of Munster and are fighting against the Emperor and the Duke of Saxony. Saxony is for S A X O N Y, Duke of Saxony. This battle lasts for a full year. She will notice that the Anabaptists are not described as soldiers at all. The, the army of the Anabaptists are not trained soldiers. They are ordinary men, they are commoners, shoemakers, repairers, people who work with their hands from the army. And the Anabaptists do not want to carry real weapons. They do not want to carry real weapons. They carry weapons based on their trade, trade that they are doing. For instance, if they were a carpenter, they may carry hammer. If they are farmers, they may carry shovel. We go and fight the, the duke. Some will carry knives. And the narrative voice called them devout asses. I mean, they didn't have sins. They were religious people, but they didn't have sins. Maybe they thought that the Lord would fight the battle for them. So the leader of the Anabaptists is called John Layden. The leader of the Anabaptists is called John Layden, and I think he leads the people wrongly because he relies on prayer over training the people to be like real army. John Layden is spelled Leiden is spelled L E I D N. In this novel, in this novel, it is seen that Thomas Nash is really harsh on the Protestants, the Anabaptists. And that probably uh, speaks to his religious orientation. It's harsh on them at this point in the novel. It appears it's at this point that Henry VIII had not yet rebelled against the Catholic Church. That's why it appears. And that's why Nash is writing to favor the Catholic Church. And writing against the Anabaptists, the Protestants. In the novel, we see how Thomas Nash criticizes Thomas Worsley. 
the cardinal. Okay, now Worsley. Worsley is spelled W-O-S-L-E-Y. That is Thomas Worsley, okay, now Worsley. Who dissolved the monasteries and divided up their world among the king's men at court during the Reformation. So my Rosalie was a very faithful servant to King Henry the Earth, but I ended up like the others. Betrayed and destroyed. When he was taken to be killed, he said he regretted. And said, had I, served, had I served God the way I did my king, would not have handed me over in my gray haze. That's why I say at the point of his death. If I had served God as I did my king, he would not have handed me over in my gray haze. I mean, if he had concentrated on his job of being a priest and served God, God would not have betrayed him the way the king has betrayed him. He would not have handed me over in my gray hairs at his old age. So the Anabaptists are praying in, in the church, seeking heavenly sign in the battle. Then they mistook the sign of a rainbow for what they were praying for. So they rush for battle as the hope of victory. Then the native voice says, pitiful and lamentable was the unpitied and well-performed slaughter. So you are fighting without sophisticated weapons. And you are lying on the, on, on the supernatural to win the war instead of human strength. The native voices that John Lennon, the leader, died like a dog. All his followers were killed. John returns to England after witnessing the massacre of the Anabaptists. Jack returns to England after witnessing the massacre of the Anabaptists. Then he meets the Right Honorable Lord Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, who had died in 1547. He meets him on the way to England. While he was on his way to England, or while he is on his way to England, he meets Henry uh, Howard, the Earl of Surrey. He was an important Elizabethan figure. He was an important Renaissance figure an important Renaissance figure in the court of Henry VIII. The native voice says, destiny never defames herself, but when she lets an excellent poet die. He refers to the poet as prince in content because a poet without peer that means he venerates Henry Howard. Henry Howard is noted for um, being one of those who brought the sonnet form to England. So, John has a conversation with uh, Henry Howard. John has a conversation with Henry Howard. For instance, John had asked him why he left his country to seek up needless perils.
out there. Howard says that it is love that makes him venture so far from home. It is love that makes him venture so far from home. The name of his love is Geraldine. The name of Howard's love is Geraldine, spelled G-E-R-A-L-D-I-N-E, -E, Geraldine. Geraldine. G-E-R-A-L-D-I-N-E, -E, Geraldine. He described Geraldine in glowing terms. Geraldine is from Italy. Geraldine is from Italy. But Howard says that she has bewitched all the wise men of England. Currently, Geraldine stays uh, wet on Queen Catherine. Dowager. Jardine waits on Queen Catherine Dowager, D O W A G E R. Henry Howard first saw Jardine at Hampton Court in England. Henry Howard first saw Jardine in Hampton Court in England. In an enchanted castle. He saw her three times, saw her there three times. Henry Howard says that Henry Howard says that poetry is second mistress. Henry Howard says that poetry is his second mistress. So when Henry Howard informed Geraldine of his visit to Italy, she advises her to go, but urges her, she advises him to go, but urges him to defend her honor and name by entering into a competition and challenge in Florence, her city. When Howard informed Geraldine that he was going to Italy, Geraldine advised him to ask him to go, but that he should honor her by competing in the great competition in Florence. She says, when thou comest to Florence, the first city from whence I fetched the pride of my birth, by an open challenge, defend my beauty against all command. And that's what, exactly what Henry Howard will do when he gets to Florence. So together with Howard, Jack heads to Venice. Jack decides to go with Howard to Venice, does not return to England again. So what this means is that Travel was a huge part of education during the Renaissance period. Most of the knowledge that people had that time, they had it because they traveled to different places and experienced the different cultures in those places. So travel was a source of education and it's still a source of education to today. And when you travel to another place, you see how people do things, you experience new ways of doing things and you can bring that back home to practice. <clears throat> so together with Howard, Jack heads to Venice using Rotterdam, 
using a place called Rotterdam, with the root called Rotterdam. Rotterdam. Where they meet with Erasmus. Where they meet with Erasmus. Meet with Erasmus at Rotterdam. Erasmus is spelled E R A S M U S. That great, um, that great humanitarian scholar. That great humanist scholar in Europe at the time, during the European Renaissance, Erasmus. Erasmus was a great European uh, humanist at the time. They also met with Sir Thomas More. They also met with Sir Thomas More. He was the chancellor to King Henry VIII. And he lived between 1478 to 1535, when he was killed by the king on the orders of the king. Erasmus is so frustrated with the rulers of the time, he prefer, um, so that he prefers fools to work with than that he has decided only to write books that um, commend fools and foolishness. Erasmus is so frustrated with the rulers of the time, preferring fools to work with than that he was decided to only write books that commended fools and foolishness. Moore is interested in writing Utopia in order to serve as a contrast to the corruption and evil practices in the society of his time. So remember that book, Utopia, by Thomas More. It's, there's a literal allusion here to that book in The Unfortunate Traveler. They left Moore and Erasmus to pursue their intellectual project, and then they moved to Wittenberg. Wittenberg. Wittenberg is, is a significant city because it is where Martin Luther Jr., Kings Jr., nailed his 95 thesis on the church door in Wittenberg. On the church door. There. To question the activities of the Catholic Church and to announce the Reformation Movement. At Wittenberg, they met the Duke of Saxony, who had taken Luther's side and has supported change of the Catholic Church practices in the university. In this work, the author maintains his negative attitude towards Protestantism. There's a ceremony in the university which the, the writer satirizes. There's a ceremony in the university which the writer satirizes. Then the air suggests to Jack that they exchange the identities. The Earl of Surrey, Henry Howard, suggested to Jack that they should exchange their identities. And they should exchange their identities. Because he meant to take more liberty of behavior. The Earl of Surrey wants to take more liberty of behavior. That means he will become Jack and Jack will become him. So, they can be, so that he can behave the way he wants to behave. They arrive at the emperor's court. They arrive at the emperor's court. 
Part of the entertainment is being shown the image of Geraldine in a magic mirror as she weeps at home in penance since the Lord is not around. This act is done by a man by name Cromwell. Of course, Cromwell is a, an important historical figure in England at this time. They arrive at Venice, where a panda, a polyglot panda, who dresses like a gentleman and attends them in, uh, in English. They arrive at Venice, where a polyglot panda, who dresses like a gentleman and attends them in English. A man by name Petro di Campo Frego. Petro di Campo Frego. Texts both Jack and Henry and Earl of Surrey, Henry Howard, to a, a whole house. Where Tabitha the temptress serves as mistress. Where Tabitha the temptress serves as mistress. Tabitha is described as a wench that could set a civil affairs on it as chastity's first matter, Lucretia, which is historical and literary allusion in the work. We have the character Brown Quill, whom Jack, whom Jack as L calls his man. Tabitha bribes Jack, that is the L, with counterfeit coins. Tabitha bribes Jack with counterfeit coins. We have the character Flavia Emilia. We have the character Flavia Emilia. That's the prostitute Jack, that's the L, intends to spend the counterfeit coins on, but with whom Tabitha connives to have Jack arrested and sent to prison alongside the real L. An English man who visit them knows of their mixed identities and all that aggravates their case in the, in the prison. An English man who visit them knows of their mixed identities and that aggravates their case in the, in the prison. So it is, it is Petro de Campo Frego who comes to the aid of the, of the duo by revealing the now late Tabitha's plot, otherwise by now die. So that's how they are freed. Then we have Diamante, another character who is the wife of Castaldo. The real L falls in love with Diamante. The real L finds solace in Diamante's love while in prison. We also have Mr. John Russell, a gentleman of King Henry VIII's court who helps free the duo. That is after Petro de Campos' uh, testimony. We have Mr. John Russell, a gentleman of King Henry VIII's court who helps to free the duo. During a close retrial, Mr. Stabitha made a mistake that leads to the acquittal of Jack and L.
Aretino is gifted in the art of writing and is honored by four universities um, in these terms. In the novel, in the course of time, Damente, Castaldo's wife is pregnant and she is freed by a retino and takes to Jack. At this point, Jack parts away with the L and travels to see Italy with Damente. But he still maintains the identity of an L or that of a young L. The real L then goes to Florence. The real L goes to Florence. The L learns of the existence of another L and goes to meet him. Jack is afraid, but the L is light with him. After a brief exchange, Jack decides to return to his real identity. The L is, uh, visits Geraldine's birthplace in Florence. He recites a sonnet in praise of Geraldine when he sees the room that she was born. Of course, the L is a poet. He says, fair room, the presence of sweet beauty sprite, the place the sun upon the earth did hold. He sees the place as a holy ground and himself as a worshiping pilgrim. Uh, the, um, L of Surrey published a challenge in the court of Duke of Florence to defend Geraldine's name against any challenge or against any challenger, as Geraldine had advised him. In the novel, there is the elaborate description of the L's war outfit and armor. So several knights come out to fight. Um, against the L to defend um, the name of Geraldine. For, for instance, we have the Black Knight, we have the Knight of the Owl, Knight of the Storm, the Forsaken Knight, a well proportioned knight, the Infant Knight. All these knights present themselves to contend for the honor of the women. So all these knights perform woefully against, except the Earl of Surrey. And that is seen in the expression, only the Earl of Surrey, my master, observed the true measures of honor and made all his encounters new. New score, their armor in the dust. So great was his glory that day as Geraldine was thereby eternally glorified. So it is seen that Henry Howard has successfully defended the honor of Geraldine. So the Duke of Florence asked the victorious heir to stay with him, but he refuses as he intends to visit all Italian cities to fight for the honor of his love. The Duke of Florence asked the victorious heir to stay with him, but he refuses because he intends to visit all it Italian cities to fight for the honor of his love. But then a letter soon arrives from England asking him to return to the court as the king desires his presence. A letter soon arrives from England asking him to return to court as the king desires his presence. The heir returns to England, and Jack continues his journey through Italy. He travels to Rome, which he calls the Queen of the, which he calls the Queen of the World, and Metropolitan Mistress of all the cities. Now, Rome was Rome was quite important in the Renaissance period because it was a center of culture. It was from there that the Renaissance culture dissipated to the other parts of Europe. So that, in part, explains 
um, the epithets that are used in describing Rome in the work. The queen of the world and the metropolitan mistress of all other cities. Jack lodges in the house of Johannes the Imola. Jack lodges in the house of Johannes the Imola. Johannes the Imola is a Roman cavaliero. He shows Jack and Damenta around Rome. So, during the tour around Rome, what we notice are the many monuments in Rome. What we notice are the many monuments in Rome. And these monuments are used to remember important figures. These monuments are used to remember important figures. Remember, Johannes the Mola texts the Mante who's now who is pregnant, and um, Jack around Rome. In the sightseeing, they see many monuments which are memory tokens in the city. The, the narrative voice says, till this day, not a Roman, if he be a Roman indeed, will kill a rat, but he will have some registered remembrance of it. That is another humor in the work. That means the Romans built monuments to remember every event in their life, including even killing a rat. They will build a monument to remember killing a rat. And another important statement that you need to hear is, I was at Pontius Pilate's house and pissed against it. That is what Jack is saying, that when he saw the house of Pontius Pilate, remember Pontius Pilate in the Bible, that's a uh, biblical allusion. He said, I was at Pontius Pilate's house and pissed against it. That means he urinated on the house. Maybe because of what, what he did to Jesus. So he bribes Roman officers who, are, who accosted him um, for wearing uh, long hair instead of short hair in the city, meaning that the city has lost its values. The, the people in the city of Rome dressed in black. Only clowns wear bright costumes. My, perhaps that's another humor. Then we have literal illusion in the expression a wide, vast, spacious room it was, such as we could concede uh, Pensatos Hall to be, where he feasted all his nights of the round table together at every Pentecost, referring to the, the Green Knight story that we read in medieval literature. Note the plague that kills 100,000 people while Jack was there in Rome. Not the plague that kills that kills one hundred thousand people while Jack was there in Rome. People simply drop dead in a matter of seconds. That's how bad the plague was. People simply drop dead in a matter of seconds. Then we are now introduced to the character of Esdras Granado. You must know this character. Esdras Granado is a Spaniard. He's a bandito, meaning a villain. He was a friend and colleague of one battle. He's a friend and colleague of one battle. One battle. Friend and colleague of one battle. Battle is described as a desperate Italian. He described as a desperate Italian. Together with Esdras, they specialize in breaking into rich people's homes during the pandemic, raping the women, killing the men, and carrying away their wealth. They specialize in breaking into rich people's homes in the pandemic and raping the women, killing the men, 
and carrying away their wealth. Mostly, in most of the houses, the men had already died. So the house is defenseless because it's only women who are there. So they just go in there and carry the wealth away, committing rape and all sorts of atrocities. And then note the character of Heraclitus. Character of Heraclitus. She's a noble and chaste woman that's raped by Eldras. She's a noble and chaste woman raped by Eldras. Jack attacks, um, battle attacks Jack, but Jack aims his pistol at him while battle holds Diamante hostage. Diamante is raped despite Jack's offer of money. Diamante is raped despite Jack's offer of money. Esdras has been murdering for the Pope. That's why it's revealed in the work. Esdras has been murdering for the Pope. Are thou ordained to be worse plague to me than the plague itself? This is what Heraclitus says to Esdras, pleading for her life and honor. Heraclitus' husband is dead by the plague. It is the spoil of my honor thou seekest in my soul's troubled departure. Thou art some devil sent to tempt me. Avoid me, Satan. My soul is in my saviors. To him I have bequeathed. From him can no man take it. Heraclitus to Esdras. So Heraclitus is, goes into trauma and, and, and she faints. God's hand, like, God's hand like a huge stone hangs inevitably over my thy head. Heraclitus to Eldras. That means um, that simile that shows God's hand as God's hand of judgment in imagistic terms. She even tries to threaten him with infection from the pandemic or plague. He says, she says, a hundred infection is mixed with my breath. I breathe upon thee, a hundred deaths come upon thee. In this, we also have foreshadowing. We also have foreshadowing in the work. Death, the devil, and all the ministering spirits of temptation are watching about thee to entrap thy soul by my abuse to eternal damnation. It is thy soul thou may save only by saving mine, my honor. If thou ever earnest of a woman or hopes to be saved by the seed of a woman, pity a woman. All these are pleas of Heraclitus which fall on deaf ears. So Eras, um, Esdras is a hardened criminal and is not moved by any of these pleadings by this woman. He replies that he has been in all forms of danger and have survived them. He also recounts the hideous things that he has done. He says, my own mother gave her a box of, uh, of the ear to and broke her neck down. My own mother gave her a box of the ear to and broke her neck down a pair of stays because she would not go to a gentleman when I bet her. My sister, I sold to an, to an old Leno to make his best of her. Any kinswoman that I have knew, I, she were not a whore, knew I, she were not a whore, myself would make her one. Okay, so that tells you of the hideous things that Edwards had done. He says them to Heraclit. Then he wraps her, using her husband's body as a pillow. Whatever is born is, is born to have an end. 
That's a statement in the work. Eldras plunders the house and leaves uh, immediately. And after this, Heracles uh, had, um, we are told that Heracles has buried 14 children. And now her husband is dead. So it's, it aggravates the suffering of the woman. So the author refers to rape as enforced adultery in this case. We also have classical and literal allusion. She directly bewailed as Cephalus when he had killed uh, Procris unwittingly, or Oedipus when ignorantly he had slain his father and known his mother incestuously. That's literal allusion in the text. Heracles decides to commit suicide because she has lost her honor. Heracles decides to commit suicide because she has lost her honor. My hand and my knife shall manumit shall manumit me out of the horror of my of mine I endure. Farewell life, that has lent me nothing but sorrow. Then she stabs herself. She falls on the husband's body, and that revives the husband. The husband is revived and begins to search the house, and then he finds Jack, whom he accuses of killing the wife. Whereas the real killer has run away. <clears throat> Jack is almost hung until he makes a speech of, confes of confession. He confesses all that actually happened that night. Jack is almost hung until he makes a speech of a speech confessing all that has happened that night. A banished earl from England stays. Jack's execution after listening to his part of the story. A banished L. A banished L stays Jack's execution after listening to his part of the story. It should be noted that the banished L. Uh, from England um, from England had earlier listened to Battle's confession in another part of town. Thus, his story corroborates with that of Jack. It should be noted that the banished earl had earlier listened to Battle's confession in another part of town. Thus, his story corroborates that of Jack. After raping Heraclete, Isdras also wants to take Battle's rape victim, Diamante. This resulted in a, a quarrel and fight. Battle is mortally wounded, and his dress runs away. That's what happened. By this testimony, Jack is freed and acquitted. The banished heir tells Jack that only lasciviousness could be learned in Rome, and wonders why he travels so far, meaning that Rome is a corrupt city. Jack refers to, um, he refers to Jack's wild travel as these insolent fancies, which are but Icarus' feathers, whose wanton wax melted against the sun, will betray thee into a sea of confusion. That's classical allusion. Then we have biblical allusion in the expression, the first traveler was king, and he was called a vagabond, runagate on the face of the earth. So till today, those who travel from place to place are not valued, like the immigrant, like the migrant. They are always running away from trouble, okay? They are running, running away from something. Something is running after them. So they move from place to place looking for safety. And today they are looking for economic safety, okay? In other lands, in strangers' lands. So travel, like the travels wherein Smith puts 
uh, wild horses when they sh when they shoot them is good for nothing but to tame and bring men under. That's a negative view of travel, of traveling. This is what the banished earl says to Jack. God had no greater cause to lay upon the Israelites than leading them out of their own country to live as slaves in a strange land. That's the lot of the migrants. That which was their curse, we Englishmen count our bless, uh, blessedness. Banish out to Jack. So Banish is seen as a philosopher, one of philosophers on contemporary events. <clears throat> he that is a traveler must have the back of an ass to bear, to bear all, a tongue like a tail of a dog to flatter all, a mouth of a hawk to eat what is said before him, the ear of a merchant to hear all and say nothing. So the traveler's life is caged, doesn't have really have many choices. And so you can use that to talk about the experience of the migrant in today's world. People who live in Nigeria and travel to Europe and live in harsh situations. Because they cannot live freely as they would have lived at home. He that is a traveler must have the back of an ass to bear all. That means all the suffering in this world you must bear. A tongue like a tail of a dog to flatter all. Whatever the people do in wherever you're going, you must appear to be happy with them so that they will allow you to stay. All right? The mouth of a hawk to eat whatever is said before him. You cannot choose your food. Okay? You go to a strange man's land, you must eat whatever they eat. You don't have a choice. Okay? You long for a fancy, but there's no fancy in Europe or America. So you must eat whatever they eat. All the grasses that they eat, you must eat the grass. Okay? Like a horse. Okay? So you must have the ear of a merchant to hear all and say nothing. Because your tongue can get you into trouble. Right? So this is what the banished hell says to Jack again. Nothing so long of memory as a dog whose Italians are whose these Italians are old dogs and will carry an inquiry a whole age in memory. Italy, the paradise of the earth and the epicure's heaven. From thence he brings the art of atheism, the art of epicurizing, the art of whoring. The, the poisoning, the art of some mystery. So all evils of the earth is found in Italy. That was once a place that was as close as possible to heaven. So that means contemporary Italy is seen as a corrupt place by the air. He says, I'm a banished exile from my country, though near linked in consanguinity to the best. An heir born by birth, but a beggar now has thou ceased. So human, excuse me, human circumstances change with time. He was, he was born an heir, a highly placed person, but now a beggar in a strange man's country because he was banished. Shows how human circumstances can change by time, with time. So the heir's fortunes changed when a new pope ascended the throne and stopped his pension. A new pope ascended the throne and stopped his pension. That's when the earl's um, fortune changed. We have metaphor in the expression, I am a lamb nourished with the milk of wolves. This is what Banish Earl says to Jack. So at the end of the day, Banish Earl advises Jack to go back home to England. He says, get thee home. My young lad, let thy uh, bones peaceably in the sepulchre of thy fathers. Wax old in thy looking in thy you know uh, looking thy grounds. Be at hand to to close the eyes of thy kindred. So Banish El longs to go. Home. He's uh, he's advising Jack based on what he desires. He longs to go home. He realizes the importance of home, all right? I'm saying this to most of you, at, we want to travel to America so that you will not travel again, you understand? So the band here wants to stay at home, wants to, would like to go back home and enjoy the home, but he cannot. 
That's why he advises Jack to go back home, that there is um, something valuable um, to be in your own land and to die in your own, your own land. Okay? It says, Vanish else so longs to go home. The devil and I am desperate. He of is restored to heaven. He of being restored to heaven, high of being called to home. So he compares, the banisher compares himself to the devil. Okay? To the devil. The devil wants to be restored to heaven where he was cast down. And the banisher wants to go back to England. So that's some um, comparison. And one feels the sadness of the banished hell in that expression. Then we have Ave Maria. Ave Maria is a prayer to the Virgin Mary in Catholic worship. The first line is adapted from Luke 1 verse 28. Amen, somebody. Amen. Jack does not take to the banished hell's advice. He goes to find their mentor the courtesan that evening. So when he goes to find Damente, it is raining and it is dark. It's raining and it is dark. And so Jack loses his way and falls into Zadok's house. He falls into Zadok's house. Zadok is a Jew. And Jews at this time were not well liked. So there's, a, there's an expression of anti-Semitism in this work. So Jack sees his courtesan kissing a man. Zadok wakes up and accuses Jack and his courtesan of conspiring uh, to, uh, with his apprentice to break into his house to rob. The punishment was either to make Jack a slave or hang him according to the law at the time concerning breaking in. Zadok wants to sell Jack to Dr. Uh, Zagari. Zadok wants to sell Jack to Dr. Zagari. Dr. Zagari is another Jew in the Pope's, uh, in the Pope's service as a physician. It's a doctor. It's a doctor of the Pope. And by the Pope, we mean the ruler of the, the Pope in the Catholic Church. Jack's, Jack's body will be used for experiment. Jack's body will be used for experiment by Dr. Zachary. He offers Jack to Zachary for 500 crowns. He offers Jack to Zachary for 500 crowns. So Dr. Zachary wants to see Jack first. So Jack is served by Juliana. Jack is said by Juliana. Juliana is the Marquis of Mantua. The Marquis of Mantua. The Marquis of Mantua. That means a highly placed lady, titled lady, noble lady. Jack is said by Juliana the Marquis of Mantua, who falls in love with Jack as he's being dragged along on the street. But before then, Zachary is able to buy Jack after examining him. He locks him up in a dark room till the, till the day of the anatomy, when he will be skinned alive for experiment. Humor is found in the expression by Jack. Oh, the cold sweating case, which I conceived after I knew I should be caught like a French summer doublet. Not the fear that Jack suffers in prison. If any, if any, if any knocked at the door, I suppose it was the beetle of uh, the beetle of surgeons. Is I suppose it was the beetle of surgeons' hall come for me. So any, any noise that is made, think they are coming to come and get him for the experiment. Miserable is that mouse that lives in a physician's house. That's another humor because the, the rats in that house don't have anything to eat. 
because the doctor saves everything for experiment. He turns everything into useful materials, medicine and all. So Sagar is depicted as a stingy man. He makes good use of all crumbs that fall from his table, out of bones. After the meat was eaten off, eaten off, he will alchemize an oil that he sold for a shilling a drum. That was the kind of man he was. So Juliana sends a messenger to beg for Jack, offering to pay any amount he wants, but Sagari refuses. Then the Pope soon falls ill. Zachary advises the Pope to rest after administering his treatment. Juliana poisons the Pope's medicine and it kills the Pope's tester. Juliana poisons the Pope's medicine and it kills the Pope's tester. Juliana then implicates Zachary that he is plotting to kill the Pope. The Pope is angry and would have and would have killed Zachary and all Jews in the town. But Juliana pleads and requests that the Pope should make him forfeit all his goods, both human and otherwise, because she's trying to free that one person in Zachary's household, and that is Jack. So this request is granted by a law, and this is how Jack is released, and Zachary loses all his possessions. So Jack is then taken to the county's house, Juliana's chamber. Of course, she saved Jack because she's in love with him. She fends as well as the captors not to know what they are doing in capturing Jack and bringing him there. The narrator diverts, the narrator diverts to narrate what happened to Jack's uh, courtesan in Zadok's K. She is stripped and flogged. Sadak runs to um, Sadak runs to Zagri in his uh, Zagri runs to Zadok in his mes, me, uh, in his misery. Zadok vows revenge, like poisoning the water source of the Romans. But Zagri knows that Juliana is behind his travels and vows to revenge. Zagri runs to Zadok in his misery. And Zadok vows revenge. He wants to poison the source of water of the Romans, but Zagari knows that Juliana is behind his problems and then wants to do what? To deal with her. So Zadok intends to poison Juliana with this. Zadok intends to um, wants to poison Juliana. Zachary needs an object of revenge in the form of a beautiful lady. Of a beautiful lady. So Zagri needs an object of revenge in the form of a beautiful lady. Zadok presents him with Diamante. Diamante is polished and sent to Juliana's house. Zagri wants Diamante to help in poisoning Juliana by posing as a waiting inmate or cup bearer. He promises that Diamante will be made for life if she does what she is told. Zagri presents himself as one who is um, as one who is seeking a favor of restoration by the Pope through Juliana. Juliana promises to plead on his behalf, though she is not sure of what the Pope's response will be. It is obvious that Juliana is, on, uh, is, is interested in Damente, whose beautiful image is the reason that Damente even uh, listens to Sagri. Juliana asks Damente about her background. Damente lies that she was a, magnific a, a magnificent daughter in Venice, that she was stolen when she was young and sold to the Jew, who has been unfair to her, using Jewishly 
and tyrannically, using her Jewishly and tyrannically. She's happy to be, she's happy to be free from the Jew. So Damente turns against Sagri by divulging his secret about poisoning uh, Juliana. Juliana takes in Damente and vows to be her mother. Jack reports how Juliana had tried to seduce him while being locked up in a house. Zagri had run away to the Duke of Bourbon, the Duke of Bourbon, B-U-R-B-O-N, after giving his, um, after giving his poisoning instructions to Diamante. There he plot the destruction of Rome. Zadok is left behind for the hangman. Zadok confesses uh, his treasonable and Arsenable plans against the city of Rome. Juliana informs the Pope of Zachary's dreaded deeds and plans. Zadok is to be executed. His manner of death is cruel and torturous because he is roasted over a fire while alive. Every part of his body is made to feel excruciating pain. In conclusion, they had a small fire, such as men blow light bubbles of glass with, and beginning at his feet, they let him lingeringly burn up his limbs by limb till his heart was consumed, and then he died. Meanwhile, Diamante enjoys favor with Liana, Juliana. She is Juliana's chief bedchamber maid. Diamante is to take care of Jack, without knowing that the Diamante and Jack are in a relationship and they love each other. They are happy to be re reunited and share their stories with each other. But Juliana keeps her Jack with a pleasure, uh, with a pleasure demands, and Jack must decide soon whether to escape or succumb. Then it is St. Peter's Day. It's a day of ceremonies. Juliana elaborately dress, uh, dresses for the occasion. Damante and Jack uh, are left alone in the house. Jack and Damante rob Juliana of all her valuables and run away. And run away from the house. Juliana wants Damante and Jack caught, but she dies after a maid mistakenly administered the poison that Damante Um, had brought from Sagari's house. The maid is forced by the Pope to drink the remaining poison that killed Juliana. Meanwhile, Jack and Damante continue in the flight to Bologna, B-O-L-O-G-N-A, Bologna, where they witness the execution of Catwolf. Catwolf is spelled C-U-T-W-O-L-F-E, Catwolf. Cotwell is the brother of Battle, Esdras associate. Now, before he, he dies, Cotwell gives a long speech. He says that he was a cobbler in Verona. He says he is to die for killing Esdras of Granado, who killed his brother, Battle. He says once he received the news of his brother's death, he pursues Esdras around the world for revenge until he finds him in Bologna. Note that revenge is an important trait in the Italian blood. He rushes to confront him in, in, in public, but stalks Esdras to his home. So he refuses to confront him in public, but stalks Esdras to his, to his house, where he hides outside his door till morning. When he knocks and Esdras opens and Codwell decrees, uh, declares his mission of revenge. Esdras begs for his life and promises to and promises a cut of gold. He doesn't want to die because he fears hell and wants to have his time to do penance for his sins. Codwolf uh, would not hear of Esdras' pleas. He even wants Codwolf to command him to kill more people, even the Pope, as long as he has some time to live. Codwolf wants Esdras to denounce God and his laws and salvation and declare for the devil after causing God. God will shoot Sedras as he's blaspheming 
against God. That means he has no chance to repent. He dies in his sins of blasphemy, which is the greatest sin that anyone could commit in Christendom. The idea is that Ezra will not will rot in hell and will never make heaven. His body, uh, being dead, looked as black as a tool. The devil presently branded it for his own. Call was about Esdras. Revenge is the glory of arms and the highest performance of valor. That's what is believed in Italy. And, and uh, in the end, at the end of the story, Jack marries Damente, uh, does uh, philanthropic works because he is now very rich, and then leaves Italy and reaches uh, England's camp between Aldis and, and France. And that is how the story ends. And that is how the class ends. When we come back, we'll take on another topic of discussion. Have a blessed day.